Well, hello again. Um, welcome to the Albert Dock in Liverpool. I've come down here this morning um, in the hope of getting some images with my recently acquired Ricoh uh, GRD Mark II, um, which, thank you very much, Nick, I purchased from you um, a couple of weeks ago. Still loving it, hoping to get some decent images today. It's the first nice morning we've had for ooh, a couple of weeks now really um, which means that I've been struggling to get out at all and equally struggling to come up with a theme for this video then I thought I might take the opportunity to explain why I briefly mentioned that my boss my first boss in actual fact owned Leica 250 reporters. Uh, he actually owned four of them, believe it or not, and um, he was my first boss after I left school. Uh, I actually had a summer holiday job in 1970 and uh, I then returned the following year once I'd finished school and that's what kicked off my love affair with photography. I'd had the Yashica Minster for a year or so prior to that, um, but it was working in this black and white processing laboratory that really triggered my photographic interests. And my boss owned the concessions to send photographers around all of the large holiday camps in and around Rill in North Wales. Hence the requirement to have cameras with lots of film. And therefore he owned uh, four Leica 250 reporters. I'm not sure which model they were. Uh, Lights produced two different versions, the FF and the GG. Um, doesn't really matter which one because um, uh, nowadays they're worth an absolute fortune. Uh, lights only produced uh, less than a thousand of both types so you can imagine um, they do fetch incredible amounts of money. Uh, however as with many Leica cameras there are lots of very clever fakes on the market um, but a genuine Leica 250 is worth about 14-15,000 pounds in today's money. However, in 1970 he had uh, four of these cameras, three were working, one um, as I recall the cloth focal plane shutter had jammed or the photographer had put his finger through it, one or the other. So that was uh, going to be sent back for repair, don't know whether that ever happened. Yeah, I was taken on and put straight into the film developing darkroom. Um, the laboratory was a, um, an adapted small industrial unit with a roller shutter door at one end and the internal walls were constructed out of 3 by 2 timber um, covered in some plywood, some hardboard and even some cardboard. So on occasions there were um, holes in the walls letting light through which is a little bit worrying when you're developing reams and reams of um, 35 millimeter film. Anyway, the film processing darkroom, um, we used uh, deep tanks, large ceramic deep tanks, about five feet tall, um, so high that uh, in order to make proper use of them, we had a wooden platform in front to boost our height so that we could uh, dip and dunk the films more easily. Straightforward three bath process, develop, fix and then a very rapid wash. Uh, the whole industry really revolved around speed. Yeah, um, the process itself was very straightforward. Um, develop, quick rinse, then into the fixer, then into the final wash and 
before the nags were properly dried they were then sent through to an adjoining room where they were put through very basic and quite ancient ilfa printers which used rolls of three and a half inch wide black and white glossy paper and once they'd been printed the prints then uh, they went through a dip and dunk single track roller processor and then out through a slot in the wall to a very large um, chrome plated rotary glazer dryer uh, the drum of that was heated and because it was uh, placed right by the roller shutter door in cool weather the temperature of the uh, glazing drum would plummet causing the prints to stick and if you weren't watching the machine very closely you'd end up with um, 50, 60, 100 prints wrapped around the glazing drum, all completely ruined of course. But assuming all went well they were then sent to be guillotined. Uh, we actually also had a separate uh, deckle edge guillotine for uh, chopping giving that nice scalloped edge around uh, what we felt might be uh, the best photographs, ones that the customers might actually purchase because as soon as the photographs had been processed they were then sent back to a shop on the holiday camp um, for the holiday makers to purchase the very next day. Photographers, our first job in the morning was to load all the cassettes both for the um, the 250 reporters and the other Leicas that, uh, that the boss owned. He had a selection of three Fs and at least one 3G. Very few lenses, most were 50mm. He had some 35mm lenses. Um, and once the magazines had been loaded and the cameras checked, the photographers would head out one by one and spend from about 11 o'clock in the morning until 11 o'clock in the evening taking photographs around the camp. And that might be photos of the holiday makers just sitting in front of their caravan or their chalet. Uh, in the evening it would have involved going to the clubs and bars, taking photographs of people, having a chat and a drink, and dancing even. And then the films would come back to the lab first thing the next morning and we had literally a couple of hours to get them processed and sent back to the holiday camp where they were put on display in a small shop for the holiday makers to purchase. So a very straightforward um, operation. Everything was black and white, as I've said, and really by 1972 or 3, the market for this kind of photography was, was really well past its prime. Um, colour photography was much more common, was cheaper, and it was much easier for people to get their films processed on the high street. So the business was sold on and purchased actually by a gentleman by the name of Tony Scott Lee who was one of the photographers at the time I worked there and he later turned to um, uh, the music industry and his daughter Lisa Scott Lee is a member of the well-known pop group Steps. Little known fact. Anyway, there we go. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, brief video. So there we are. Um, just a brief explanation as to why my boss owned three or four Leica 250 reporters. Thank you for sticking with me. Sorry it's been of a sort of uh, a filler kind of video. Um, it may well be the last one I do before Christmas. So with that in mind, I'm going to wish everybody a very Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year. I'll see you all in 2022, but in the meantime, stay well, keep taking images. Bye-bye for now.